On the show tonight, we have a special guest interview with Dan McInerney. He'll show us how to script our life in Python and inject HTML or JavaScript into user sessions. Get our take on the RSA conference, and I can assure you that Jack is going to be extra grumpy this week. Jeff Mann joins us in studio for extra grumpiness, and stories of the week will include, wait for it, WordPress vulnerabilities, and more on this edition of Security Weekly. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security, training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org and learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. Now, fire up a packet capture. Pour yourself a beer or something else, stronger perhaps. Give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, looking sexy as ever, maybe more so with that beard, Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. I had an intro in there. You didn't <laughs> use it. <laughs> Look, I, I, got, I got this part of the <laughs> intro this, right. We're shuffling papers over here. We don't know I, what to do. I stared at the camera and everything. Difficulties. Get, that's great because the, 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 the shot <laughs> clips off the shiny part of my forehead and everything, so it's he, really well done. read the intro. It wasn't that good. No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone. Hey, it's been a month since I've been here. I'm out of I'm out of touch. This is episode 416 for Thursday, April 30th, Holy 2015. I'd like to introduce Mr. Jack Daniel to my right here in studio. Hello, hello. It's outstanding to be back with everyone. Missed a few weeks, and I'm going to miss a few more due to crazy travel. But glad to be in studio. Glad to be uh, mixing drinks. Sorry I missed Apollo last week. But yes, uh, it was an epic episode. And uh, I may be a little bit cranky after last week at RSA, and not for all the reasons that you might expect. So um, fasten your seat belts, uh, tray tables locked and upright. Mr. Jeff Mann is in studio from Tenable Network Security. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Paul. I'm, I'm here for grumpiness, and I, I hope I live up to expectations. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I'm sure. You've been here for a couple of days now, and there's been a lot of grumpiness. So. There has been a lot of grumpiness. Yeah. It was good. Jeff and I did a SCADA webcast this week. That was fun. We did. It was SCADAs. Awesome. It went well. SCADAs. SCADAs. Ooh. Yep. On the lines via Skype, we've got a cast of characters. Mr. Mike, uh, Michael Santar <laughs> Crand Cangello. 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 That's a new one. That's a new one. Yeah, that is a new one. And I like that one. <laughs> Michael Santa uh, Cangello shots. Um, <laughs> What's going on? Sorry, Michael. I'm Ken Jellen. Are you? I'm looking forward to some of Jack's travel because it means I'm actually going to see Jack next week. That's right. Excellent. Mr. Joff Thayer's on the lines via Skype as well. Welcome, Joff. <laughs> G'day, Paul. Good to be back again. Yes. Good and not Kevin. Everybody. Yeah, not Kevin's here with us, too. Hey, how's it going, Paul? It's nice. We can see all three of you guys in one shot. You look beautiful. All three is. So the camera's not working, is what you're saying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Need some adjustments. Are you ready to learn combat firmware analysis, register for my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments? A two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and the Arsenal Talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. Don't forget to register for B-Sides Boston coming up on May 9th. Well, I will be there presenting as well as many of us here from the Security Weekly cast and crew will be in attendance to B-Sides Boston on May 9th. And we're going to talk about stories for the week first. How about that? Is everyone oh, ready shocking. to talk about stories? Shocking. Shocking. Shocking that we have a WordPress vulnerability or three to talk <laughs> <Yes>. about. What <laughs> 
There was, in fact, a... Wait, a, wait, let me... We're supposed to be on episode 416. Bring the show notes up a couple... Of, oh, no, that is current, isn't it? Yeah. Shit. Yes, it is. <laughs> There's actually a cross-site scripting vulnerability in the core WordPress engine, mm. which is kind of interesting. And yeah, Word, that was interesting. Yeah, WordPress released fixes uh, rather quickly, actually. Uh, this Monday, we were doing a lot of WordPress updating, and uh, there was some pretty glaring cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And uh, it was bad. They're pretty uh, practiced at uh, rolling out fixes. So they're getting yes. good at it. Yeah. Yeah. We really could get better at writing their code. <laughs> well, it's good. It's good to see that they're being responsive, uh, you know, which is completely appropriate, right? So, uh, you know, a little bit of, little bit of uh, kudos there. Right. And it is in the core engine, which is not as common as, you know, the every single day plug-in uh, plug nightmares in. we get. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're responsive. I found an interesting one in a plug-in this week. Do tell. It was a three-year-old plug-in, and we were on the latest version. So it didn't notify us that there was an update. We were like, we're on the latest version. Everything's good. Well, after some testing, I'm like, that is a cross-site scripting vulnerability. I'm like, there's no way that that is not a cross-site scripting <laughs> vulnerability. <laughs> And I'm like, the pl there's no mention of it anywhere. There's no exploit published for it. It's just nothing. And uh, Chris did some more research. He's like, oh, apparently they abandoned development on that plugin and created a new plugin. I'm like, hmm, so let's install the new plugin <laughs> and not use the old one. <laughs> and magically, that cross-site scripting vulnerability <sighs> no longer exists. It was a, a really... it was. An so Paul was one. then there was there no way for you to tell that the plugin had been sunset. No, there was no indication. Wow, no indication. That's interesting. Other than yeah. visiting the plugin, and it, it was glaring, dude. It took so if you put whatever website it was forward slash question mark, whatever you put after the question mark got dumped into the form action field for this plugin. Ooh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> bad. It was, it was bad. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I want to I wanna look at this. I, I got kind of three questions. I'll toss them all out there, uh, and then maybe they're worth discussing or not. Were it you feels doing to it me on an airplane? No, wait, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> or, and tweeting about it at the same time. Uh, no, look, I, I look at this, and I go, okay, so there, I know that there's a lot of people, and there's a lot of small businesses that run WordPress, right? So obviously it's garnered a lot of attention because of that. I'm curious at the enterprise level how many are running WordPress, um, because, again, right, when I look at this and I go, well, it's novel, is it anything I need to do or not do? Uh, I, I'm always curious your, your take on that. But I'm also curious, I feel like zero day gets thrown around a lot. So is this a legitimate zero day? Uh, or is it just a vulnerability, but it sounds sexier when we call it zero day? I would, and then the last part about it, I, I just, I'll uh, ask this and then I'm going to kind of shut up. There's way too many it's cross-site scripting. Like. All right, then I'm going to shut up. I'll ask my other All question. Right, so hold on. Let me address your first question. So yes. WordPress, whether you're using their cloud service or whether you're rolling your own instance of it, is really easy to set up. So while I today agree. in an enterprise you may think you don't have WordPress, tomorrow you might. And I've mm. been on penetration tests for organizations and have discovered that, oh, lo and behold, look, marketing stood up a WordPress server. Oh, well, that's interesting. And, oh, look, it, you can brute force the passwords. And, oh, look, I can get shell from that. In, oh, look, now, so is there a scan? Is there a basic scan then that as a, as a security leader I could uh, operate to look for WordPress in my environment? Uh, it's a great question, Mike. It actually ties into a lot of research I've been doing lately. So a lot of the automated tools will tell you if you're, what version of WordPress you're running. Now, there's a much hmm. smaller percentage of them that will actually go out and say the version you're running has vulnerabilities. And I think that's because it's very difficult to tell from the release notes in WordPress, like what they fixed on an uh, automated basis, right? So some tools do attempt to tell you that, but the severity level of those vulnerabilities is almost always low. And I don't okay. know if it's because of the confidence level that, that we don't know if WordPress, for example, puts out a new version and they didn't fix any security vulnerabilities, it's just an update. You know, should that, that's a low severity, but if they had security fixes, it should be a higher severity. A lot of the tools aren't making the distinction. Um, so that's one thing. There are, um, when you scan WordPress, it, you're, you have like mixed results um, as to your results with it. I've done a lot of scanning of WordPress sites. So 
and without giving away too much about my project, but so in testing web application scanning tools, I've discovered that different tools will report a finding that the other ones will not, and often those findings are very critical. Yep. Which is kind of interesting. So there's definitely differences but, in the tools. So the, the so the core point or the core answer is if you look at it and go WordPress, pff, that's not what we do, blah, blah. No, it might not be what you do, but it doesn't mean you don't have it. Right. And when you go to look for it, you might want to be critical. Uh, take a different look at the tools that you're using and ask a couple better questions than you might normally ask. Yeah. And WordPress is not. Uh, a performance monster doesn't perform very well. Lots of functionality. I think the uh, functionality trumps performance when it comes to WordPress. So, if you put a security plugin on there, such as uh, what is it, iThemes, Chris? Is that the one you're using? iThemes security plugin. Great plugin. However, it can automatically write rules, which means if you get attacked a lot, you're going to have a lot of rules which need to be processed, mm -hmm. which means your performance is going to be in the crapper. So, uh, I I don't I don't know the right. Answer to so basically, it. only security people will write will use that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Everybody else will disable that the minute their performance dives. Yep, exactly. All right. So, so question two: Is this a real zero day? Uh, the Are one we that, using that properly? The one that I discovered. Yes, or the one the the big one in the core engine of WordPress. Well, the core we engine of WordPress, way. I believe, was privately reported and worked in collaboration with WordPress. To so do we call that it. a zero day, or I mean, it, it's it, just somebody discovered a vulnerability? So the reason right, I'm asking well, is right, because I, right I, now, I think Mike, we need it's to not a, parse it's not the a zero day. It's not a zero day right now because there's a patch for it. That's how I would describe it. So then, when the researcher said, "Hey, I think I found a bug," all bugs now are instantly zero days. Yes, before okay, there's right. a patch, that's a zero day vulnerability. And then, if you were an exploit for it, that's a zero day exploit. Anyone care to? Am I wrong there, Joff? Not Kevin. Like, is that is that no, your understanding no, I mean, of the I, definition as well? That's my understanding of the definition. Zero day is 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 something that's that's you know what, when it's revealed, it's it's out there. There is no um, there is no remediation, and there and there is uh, potentially exploits available for it. Um, that that that's the way I read zero days. Once once there's a remedi remediation a patch, it's no longer zero day. Yeah. I agree. I, okay. I, I have to agree. I, I think once the POC is out there, it's a zero day. Yep. So yep. What's your cool. third? And often when zero days hit the street, the uh, proof of concept, the, there quite often is proof of concept code that comes with it because the security researcher that did the uh, initial work on zero days probably managed to do a denial of service on the code in question, and the proof of concept comes directly out of a denial of service typically, and an exploit is essentially modifying that denial of service to the point at which the code does, um, uh, at, at which the uh, um, code that's attacking the vulnerability has the ability to, to obtain uh, control of the program pointer, right? The, the instruction pointer and actually exploit, right? All right. All right. So here's, here's the, th so the first question was if I'm a leader, should I care? And the answer is yes. And you should be careful or at least consider the tools you use. Second question then is, are we using the language right? And that matters because if I'm going to go brief somebody else and I use the phrase zero day, I'd, I'd like to make sure I'm using it properly and I understand it. So here's the third question. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of a cross-site scripting? Just because, I, again, we say XSS all the time. We talk about it. Uh, and I think it's one of those things where, you know, we all, oh, yeah, no, I totally know what that is. But just don't ask me to explain it. Hey, before so we go it, there. What's a quick explanation? Okay. Well, well before we go there, um, I think there is a sense of urgency that is often uh, con uh, conferred with a with zero day. A zero day kind of has that, um, in my opinion, and tell anybody tell me if you disagree. Kind of has that neon lights kind of uh, uh, impact to it when people say they say zero day, and it, and the problem with that is there are some zero days that while the vulnerability exists, uh, the impact of the exploit is negligible or sometimes even nothing. Uh, and so that, that, that urgency level, that, that risk level is sometimes, you know, it's all over the map, right? It's, in some cases, it can be very, very bad, but in some cases, it can be near nothing. So that, that yeah, is I think that's actually why I was asking that question initially, because I looked at it, and it carries a connotation of danger, 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 do something now. That's and right. That's, 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 I'm glad you said that, because you helped me articulate my question better. Yeah, that's so, not, not well, always there's a, true. There's an implication in your question that perhaps there's some 
there's something between what Joff was describing between calling it a zero day and calling it an exploit that, you know, there's there's that area in between, okay, it's a vulnerability, it's known, and there's some potential or hypothetical way of exploiting it, or, but we don't know that somebody's written an attack that's out there in the wild yet versus when it actually, okay, now we know there's something out there, we've seen the evidence that there's an attack out there, so we can say it's an exploit. It, that's especially critical with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because yeah. there are so many factors that go into, into how critical that vulnerability could be, it depends on a lot of things. What kind of code can I execute? And when I execute code, what can I get? For example, um, there was a cross-site scripting vulnerability, I believe, in an e-commerce plugin for WordPress. Now, that's especially troubling because now it involves commerce. So can I manipulate the store somehow um, to do bad things? So to go back to your last question, Mike, about what is cross-site scripting, I would call it uh, code execution in the browser. Would you agree, Joff? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the direct result of a cross-site scripting flaw in an application. You get code execution in the browser. Um, when you get code execution in the browser, the impact um, amounts to what can you do from there, right? I mean, it, you know, what, what cookies can you ascertain uh, in terms of uh, the, the function of that application? Are they session cookies? Are they authentication cookies? Are they... Uh, uh, or... or or are you not getting that? You know, or or what? You know, how much code can you run? In some cases, with cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, you're very, very limited into what you can do initially. So some of the impact is not nearly as bad. So, Joff, how are you? I mean, you do a lot of web app pen tests, still, correct? Uh, I I used to. <laughs> no, I do. I do, I, I do web app tests. I haven't done many in, in the past month or so. But So uh, <clears throat> the browser's ability to block cross-site scripting code, I found has come a long way. And yeah, you know, there's things ways have around a lot it. better. But yeah, it, code just doesn't like, you, you don't get that dialog box when you're testing anymore. Because Chrome, Firefox, and IE, I found all have really good cross-site scripting protections to prevent that code from running, essentially. So, Paul, let me ask. Um, you, you defined cross-site scripting by saying what the outcome is, what the result is, which is code execution, um, which doesn't technically describe what cross-site cross -site scripting is or does. Is that the only outcome of cross-site scripting, or is that the only outcome that anybody cares about? Well, it's code execution, uh, to further qualify that, right? Code execution in the browser, in the context of the website that you're visiting. Okay. So then the repercussions stem from there. Like Joff was saying, you know, can I grab a cookie? If it's an e-commerce system, can I see people's orders? Can I do all kinds of other things within the application itself? Right, right. I, or, or for example, can I paint a form over an existing form that takes input and feeds that data off to me in some of my data store instead of to the actual legitimate application, right? I mean, there, there are real ramifications that can occur with, with cross-site scripting, and it's up to the creativity of the attacker. Um, and that's actually one of the challenges in pen testing without getting too far off of a tangent, was we tend to demonstrate cross-site scripting by popping a dialog box. Which is um, bad. I wish we never did that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's not a very good demonstration. And, and in some cases, I've demonstrated it in some of our tests with different things, like I've injected images of a cookie monster or stuff like that. <laughs> um, you know, just for having a little bit of creativity and having a little bit more fun with it. Um, if you, you know, want to see a great list, Joff, have you ever gone to xss-payloads.com? Uh, you know what? I haven't. I, I, the some minute great you said that, there. I was thinking about yeah. the uh, XSS me stuff that um, yeah. through OWASP, but. Um, this website's great. I mean, it's got key loggers that you can do through cross-site scripting. It's got, um, I, I don't think there's a steel browser yeah, history. Let's, let, but let's, um, hey, Paul, let's, why don't we put that one in the show notes? Um, absolutely. Yeah, that That's would be good. good. Um, yeah, and let me just point out why I'm asking some of these questions. A, uh, I, I, any chance to learn from you guys, I'm going to take it. But, but again, I look at this and I go, okay, so we keep talking about these types of vulnerabilities every week. And, and uh, on, on some level, based on the ecosystem, it's going to take a while to tamp these things down. But then on the flip side, if we want to go articulate this to people better, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're using good language and that we're able to quickly articulate what's going on to somebody 
And based on the stuff today, if I was if I was better at taking notes, I, I have exactly what I need to go tell somebody else what's going on and why I need to get the right scanner to look for this in our environment to keep us better protected. Like it's now, you know, I'm going to ask th this next question in terms of all the things that I would need to focus on this week. Uh, if I don't already have that capability in a scanner, is this big enough that I, I should maybe be looking for it? Or this is one of those things, again, it's good to make your case, know about it, but you know, there's so much other stuff going on. I think if you, if you don't have a mechanism to do web application scanning at some automated capacity, that should be your focus for the week. And there if you, you want advice on that, yeah. feel it free to drop me a line. And that's not just because it's been with some your focus for the week. Right? Yeah, and well. it's been my focus for the week. So <laughs> well, feel I, I free think to the, the other me. thing to say is, is cross-site scripting is, is one of the more common flaws that is found in, mm -hmm. in web apps. But it's also one of the ones that is um, easily, reasonably easily detected uh, in, 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 okay. in, in the most common cases. Un unless you're looking at a very obscure... Yeah, there's a lot uh, of... Friend. Well, the, the problem is there's so many different web application technologies, developers... Yeah, there are, the, I, I mean, there's I, that's so why many, I qualified yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Reasonably right. easily detected. Um, there are often cases that are, uh, are quite, quite a, li a, a lot more obscure. Um, let's say they have some very basic filtering uh, in the application where they're filtering out, um, um, and, you know, the angle brackets pretty yeah. nice, less than, greater than. Um, that's fine, but there are there are evasion techniques that we can use to get around that, um, and and still get code execution in, in in the browser, or still get that reflected um, code execution. So, I, and, and I there, I still can't believe we're talking about this so many years later. I don't know, right? <laughs> it, right? But but, but there as long as we're talking about, it, is there is there a fix besides going back and rewriting the code, or are there other things that people can do in you know in the near term? Well, well, there's certainly filtering systems that can be put in front of web applications that will act as a sanitizing uh, entity, you know, in WAF, for example, web applications. <laughs> but th that's a that is literally a Band-Aid. I mean, the, the right, you know, when I'm dealing with customers, I'll actually tell them, if you have a WAF, I prefer if I test without it. Yep. yep. Because if I test with it, um, I'm just going to test that your Band-Aid is actually working, and if your actual application behind it is still vulnerable, I'm not really doing you a great service. Well, it's, it's yeah, I, I like to, we've talked about on the show before, Jeff, right? It's three different tests. I want to test with the WAF off. Yep. Then I want to test with uh, the WAF on, or I'm sorry. WAF wanna, on, WAF off? Yeah, WAF on, WAF <laughs> yeah, off. WAF you on, know WAF what off. I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the I'm other still thing, looking for the, the third the one. The pen though. test kid. Uh, off, so, on. Uh, it's on, off, on. Well, the on, other thing off, to point on, out okay. that's, that's really. So you test the WAF. I'm sorry, Jeff, one second. So if you, te you test the WAF. And then you say, okay, take all those protections off. I've shown you how your WAF can detect vulnerabilities, and that gives the client some visibility into, okay, how well or not right. well are my protections working. Then you test the actual app itself. You find all the exploits. Then you take all those exploits, and then you run them through the WAF again, and you try and see if you can get them through the WAF. Gotcha. So they get right. the full suite of testing. Sorry, right. Jeff. Go ahead. So pen yeah, test, vulnerability well, assessment, I, I, really good pen test. Yes. <laughs> you know, while we're in sort of definitional mode, the other thing that's really important to point out is there is a considerable risk uh, difference between cross-site scripting that is just reflected in the application versus cross-site scripting that is stored in the application. Yeah. Stored is very, very dangerous because when you store a script in a database and the application allows you to store that script, it doesn't go away. Sometimes for years it doesn't go away. And I've actually got a funny story. Um, we, I found a stored vulnerability in one of our, our recurring customers and uh, one of the testers came back six months later, and he got exploited by my stored uh, <laughs> or, uh, script that, that I dropped in there. And the reason it happened was we were using some test accounts that were common, and the customer came back and said, well, you can have these same test accounts. Oh, you know, really bada-bing, bada-boom, I left a script there. Now, n now, I didn't leave it there maliciously. They were test accounts, and I just didn't, mm. didn't worry about cleaning up in this particular case. So it just it kind of proved the point that they reflected cross-site scripting can come back and bite you, and in this case, came back and, and bit stored, my yeah. colleagues. But yeah, uh, sorry, the stored cross-site scripting. Yeah. Oh, well, look, I mean, sorry. I'm sorry. All, all I was going to point out is that p part of what I keep looking at, right? So I didn't spend as much time on it this week as you did, Paul. But when we look at issues that we've been dealing with for a decade or two decades, what I'm starting to realize just listening is is I learned a lot today, and I've been around this. I don't have the the, the chops on this particular topic that you guys have, but. There is a ton of complexity. And, and, and if you think about where we are talking about it now to where we were five minutes ago, there is a lot of complexity that we covered. And one of the big challenges that we have is to translate that complexity into comprehension. And until we can get that right, 
-hmm. we're not going to see wholesale changes. So that's yes. why I ask some of these this questions. This is a great example of that, Mike, and I think the reason why we see a lot of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities lingering around in people's networks. It's, it's, but, it's a but difficult one But I get frustrated by them. But Paul, yeah. I get frustrated by them because it actually, that this particular example is, is reasonably easy to communicate to a development team to say, look guys, really just standardize, look at the industry, uh, at your best input validation routines and standardize on the best practices and make sure you're implementing them adequately because the, the technologies exist to filter this stuff out coming into the application and there are plenty of frameworks that now do very, very effective filtering of all these kinds of attacks, uh, in, you know, in the cross-site scripting case particularly, which is the most common one. Um, and not only are the frameworks doing it now, as Paul pointed out earlier, the browsers are starting to do it as the, as the text is getting reflected back. That, you don't want that to happen. That's sort of your last resort. But the frameworks and the code to, to mitigate the issue from an input validation uh, perspective exist, and they are good, and, and folks just have to use them. So you're bringing up two issues, Jeff. One is how do we... Uh, get access to the developers to have the conversation, especially when you're, as a pen tester, you're probably not reporting back to, de to the developers. You're probably reporting to, you know, some level of management that's, you know, several hops away from the development team. Um, yeah. The second issue is, uh, and maybe it's not an issue, maybe it's more in the form of a question, how much of the cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that you or any of us have run run across are coming from code that was, you know, custom written by that development team yeah. versus, you know, some of the building blocks that they're using and some of the code that they've inherited or, you know, borrowed or, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and that's just Oh, it. you're dead you on know, target. Who, yeah, who are the developers? Are right. they in-house developers? Are there contractors that you hired to write software right. for you? Right. Are they open source developers? Are they working for a vendor of yours and you bought their software? Right. So the developers are kind of all over the place. Did you give them a guideline? Do you enforce that guideline? Mm -hmm. Guide Line readily understood. I mean, go back to it too. You're coming as a pen tester. If you're pointing out problems, very few of us like having somebody come to us and say, "Man, you screwed up. Let me let me show you where you screwed up and what an easy fix it was." So yeah, there's there's a lot of issues to this that uh, hopefully we'll keep unpacking as we go. So well, you know, uh, eBay uh, <laughs> eBay hasn't uh, uncovered a lot of those issues. It had a cross-site scripting vulnerability that a researcher from Estonia, Giannis Cap Cap Cape. K K A A P, but the A's have two dots over them each. How do you say that? That's uh, a guttural uh, thing that we can't do. <laughs> <as American. laughs> wait, wait, wait to European. Yeah. Well, wait, Paul. Before you go there, I just want to make one comment. I'll, I'll make it quick and close it out. Um, one of the other things that I'm dis discovering, which is which is kind of disturbing to me, is cross-site scripting uh, and cross-site request for forgery vulnerabilities that are occurring cross-platform where I'm testing a mobile API and I'm mm. able to inject text into an application that then becomes a problem for the web app. Mm -hmm. So it is getting more complex just to reinforce that Absolutely. point um, with the mobile platforms because the mobile platforms are opening up an additional vector of attack. And I feel e like we got to throw in IoT and then we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Can we come full circle? E -E <laughs> well, eBay had a cross-site scripting vulnerability that Estonian researcher reported it uh, a year ago. And they, they said, yeah. They fixed it quickly? No, so they that said, was yeah. a year long zero day. <laughs> that could be a problem, but, you know. And then they said, well, three months later, yeah, I suppose we should fix seven, eight months later. A year later, he's like, screw it, I'm dropping it. <laughs> and put it out there. And uh, did, they, did they fix it? No, they have not fixed it. Hmm. They have not fixed it yet. So um, we would call this a zero day. We would call this a zero Plus 365. Day. It's a 365 now, day. The researcher <laughs> did say that uh, it could be very difficult to exploit this particular cross-site scripting vulnerability. So we'll just so call it a vulnerability. It's a vulnerability. Less hype. Less yeah, when, hype. When, when somebody says that, I always consider that challenge thrown. You yeah, know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might know that, actually, right? All right. Uh, oh, no, nothing. I'm sorry. He wrote, he doesn't believe there are any limiting factors for an XSS payload. Sorry, I was wrong. I thought mm -hmm. he said there so were. Totally he says there are not. Yeah, that, that's the exact opposite. That is the exact <laughs> opposite. Like, Forget okay. what I said before. He's, I read it wrong. He said uh, that he doesn't believe there are any limiting factors for an XSS payload. So does that make it a zero day? Well, I think the fact there's no patch makes it a zero day.
Thought we That's sort of like we saying the barn door is right, wide open. Just come on in. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's exactly. And he's what asserting then that he has the proof of concept that this works, right? So right. So so what what we're kind of saying is to be a zero day, it needs to be uh, uh, no patch available, but it, it also there needs to be a proof of concept or or proof of exploit. Right. Okay. I like it. So I mean, but, I don't like it, but. I got to throw out there. But it's there. just eBay, so I, I mean, no. I've got to throw out like there. Th critical. Like many definitions, if you have a conversation with somebody, you need to level set what you yes. mean by words. Right. Absolutely. Because yeah. even where I mean, just ask people what the difference between a threat, a risk, and a vulnerability is. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> right. So that's uh, yeah. What do you What do you mean by threat intelligence? A list of IP addresses? Oh, this is kind of like antivirus, except there's nothing to protect me at all except i got to do stuff okay or do you actually mean something by threat intelligence you know you, we need to make sure uh, yeah. there are so many words cyber hacker <laughs> apt they, 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 just so many make sure you know who you're talking to and, and how you define otherwise things. you won't be a game changing thought leader that <sighs> and make the world a better place like hulu Cyber for, for the children, so the terrorists don't win. You got to get it right. <laughs> that's that's Jack. You wanted to rant about RSA, <laughs> uh, so wow. it's not good thing I didn't fire. Well, I got you wound up a little bit. I want to turn the crank a few more notches and let it go. Right. It's not specifically RSA. It's okay. the whole greater RSA thing. So one of the revelations last week, which I've always known, but it really struck me hard last week. Um, a lot of people were on the Twitters making fun of RSA and those of us that go to RSA and uh, those who make their living in this industry uh, throwing rocks at those of us who go to where the business of security is done is kind of hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Not saying there are a bunch of hypocritical bastards on Twitter, but there are a lot of hypocritical bastards on Twitter. Um, it's really great that you're drawing a paycheck from an industry that uh, its major business event is RSA. Now, you don't have to like the fact that it's um, a commercial enterprise. Uh, you can pretend it's not, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see those, we'll see you working at uh, wherever it is you work to make a living and, and contributing to open source packages and nothing else. Uh, so maybe admit we're all trying to make a living. Uh, maybe admit that a lot of us that go there are trying to ad advance the state of security while making a decent paycheck. That's not to say the expo floor is not horrifying. Uh, this year, there were, depending on which set of numbers you saw on which billboard, 503 sponsors and exhibitors. Wow. 503. The noise level was astounding. I mean, I did the, the, the noise level was deafening. And I mean that both literally, there were too many people to have a conversation, and figuratively, as in the signal to noise ratio, required like logarithmic scales to actually find any signal. It was terrifying. But, but you know what terrifying. I find fascinating about that as somebody who didn't go is, I mean, just think 15 years ago, you couldn't get 500 sponsors, vendors, and, and other folks. No, 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 absolutely not. And this So, event, I mean, take right. that as a sign of our growth. I mean, that's right. And remarkable. so there's one of the things that really wound me up. So I'm at your on... <laughs> is the hmm. new CEO of RSA, right? He's one of the folks that came over from Net Witness and is part of the, uh, you know, the acquired company taking over the acquiring company. And he gave a keynote. I did not see it. I talked to a lot of people that, that saw it. I watched the Twitter stream and, and conversations with folks. And he gave a uh, drama-filled, dark room, turn up the lights, Scary ass, whatever keynote. We started. Talked, we talked about that last week too, Jeff. I, yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on it because so I, I, I think here's, we share the same First thoughts. of all, he comes out and he's wearing like a dress shirt or something and a pair of jeans uh, to prove he's not Art Calviello. It's like, okay, yeah, we get that. Uh, guess what? It's going to take a lot more than an RSA CEO in jeans to fix this. Uh, the state of security. He said one of the dumbest things that uh, I've heard in a while from somebody at a keynote. That's stunning. And then I realized it wasn't dumb. Um, he was lying to us. He lied, uh, lied to everyone in the room and everyone in the industry. Because Amit is not an idiot. He is a really smart dude. And what he said in the middle of RSA is that the InfoSec industry is a failure. He's yep. sitting in the middle of 33,000 at an event proving it's wrong. So he lied to us to make a point. 
lying to us to make a point at the largest gathering doesn't help. Let's so he's have, crazy uh, like a fox? Let's have an honest conversation. It was drama for drama's sake. It was. Yep. And it, was, it wasn't an honest one. Had he, I think, come out and said, maybe have the PR people work on the, on the wording, come out and said, the industry is in fantastic shape. It's better than it's ever been, yet we're failing to do what it is we're supposed to do. Um, that's different. Uh, but I just thought it was really... You got to do more than put on jeans to make a difference here, buddy. Um. Well, you know, Jack, well, we talk, let me get your opinion on this because here's my comment on it from last week distilled down to one line. He didn't use the language of leadership at, at any level. Telling people they failed, right? And as Jeff just said, without defining the terms and stuff, you, you, and I, you know, no disrespect, I have a lot of friends in PR. This isn't a PR person thing. This is a leadership thing. He needed to come out and be aspirational. And, and I'm actually, frankly, tired of, of hearing oh, about okay. how we, we suck and we failed and there's gaps. The world is freaking changing. And actually, I think we're doing an okay job adapting to it. Can we do better? Absolutely. Here's three things we can go focus on. That would have been I, a much more powerful speech. Absolutely agree on the leadership and you and I have talked about this. If you know, RSA is not the place. The keynotes tend to be vendor driven. They tend to be product driven. Sure. Um, but Michael, you and I have talked about this. One of the things that drives me nuts is when somebody uh, does a keynote, uh, it ought to be a keynote. Damn it. Yep. It ought to be inspirational. I mean, it's okay. If you terrify people, you have to have an impact. It would be great if they get up and do something. Sometimes it just needs to, you know, crushing people's souls and leaving them to heal, uh, but give them a path, but do something, make, move the people. And I, I don't think that was more than, more than cheap drama. Uh, but, you know, you, yeah, a couple of I'm things. Gonna... One of the things that really came out in this, so there was no trusty con again this year. They said that was going to go on forever. Uh, so last oh. year's boycott thing, not only did it not yeah. happen, um, some of the boycotters were uh, on stage at RSA more than once. Huh. So, um, again, I'm not saying... Did they, but had they taken I, the Blue Cloak Pledge? I, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the challenges that you know that brought to me was the point I made on Twitter, and I want to just reiterate it. So 33,000 people there for argument. You know, so DEF CON's kind of cage you about the numbers, but we know that in excess of 15,000 people go on the big years at DEF CON. So let's use big round numbers, 30,000 and 15,000. Um, 14,000 people, just pulling numbers out of my ass. Uh, 14,000 people that go to DEF CON uh, hate RSA and everything it stands for and publicly ridicule it. And 28 or 29,000 people at RSA hate the dirt, dirty hacker hippie scumbags that go to uh, DEF CON. And there are, Did you work on that with a PR person, Jack, no, before you said that? No. And there are, depending on how you want to count, hundreds, maybe a thousand, maybe over a thousand now, folks that go to both and have one foot in both camps. And realize that uh, by further segmenting, further siloing the knowledge, the skill, the talent, the experience, the expertise, whatever resources we don't have enough of, we're making it worse. We're making it worse and making it obvious to outsiders that we can't act like adults and shouldn't be invited to have a seat at the table in Washington when people yep. make rules for us. We need to go, that or doesn't in your organizations. Mean, right, that doesn't mean you have to like the expo floor at RSA. You can be horrified by that. There were 490 talks. Factoring out the sales pitches, which are mostly in the keynotes now, there were hundreds of good talks. Were they yep. cutting edge exploit talks? Only a few of them. Um, were they relevant to most business folks that show up at that event? Were they relevant? Were they on topics that make a difference about containerization and cloud and securing that? Were they, there were 11 or 12 on how to speak to management, how to speak yeah, to the boards, how mm -hmm. to speak to executives. Two of them were in the crowdsource track. Uh, John Dixon and Kai Axford both gave good talks. John Dixon gave a stunning talk, but he has the, the position of having been you know, Air Force Intel, then a techie, and now an executive, and has been in all those worlds. You know, there were a lot of very good talks. They weren't all popping shells, uh, but there were some, you know, there were some exploits. But there's real value there. And if you just want to tear it down, then then great. That's why, that's part of why we don't get taken seriously. And it's... Um, but what I'm hearing you're saying is right talk, wrong audience. 
So there was a, there was a lot of that. And then one of the other things is there was actually some interesting stuff. Um, there were some innovative things there. There were things that I've only seen talked about in um, academic papers or in research papers from folks like MITRE. Uh, there were some interesting things. The one that stands out to me, I didn't get a, dig, a good look at, and I forget the product name. It, this is not an endorsement. I've never used it. Um, but it's it's a sign of something that I think is headed in the right direction. And it, where was it presented at RSA? Uh, one of the, the exhibitors, sponsors, vendors, whatever they're called, is, uh, was Shape. Shape Security, I believe, is the company's name. And they do polymorphic website rewriting. So we all have been fighting polymorphic uh, malware for years and years. One of the things that academics have talked about for a long time is uh, self-defending software and hardware. And one of the challenges is that you know it, it needs to deliver the same result all the time. But uh, in the narrow definition of let's defend against scripted attacks on web properties, they're rewriting enough of it that your scripted attack tends to fail quickly. Even if you succeed, it rewrites so often that you're never going to make that second step. That's the kind of stuff that... Raising the cost, that's great. Exactly. It raises the cost to the attacker. That's the kind of stuff that we have been ignoring for years because the academics have been talking about this for decades. Right? Um, you know, I, and, I, and actually, I just wanna... that came out of, uh, that had to have come out of some academic research. I haven't met the executives there yet. But, and that's not, like I said, not an endorsement. There's like, there are people doing interesting things. I mean, yes, there are a lot of people screaming and telling you you need to spend too much money on antivirus. Um, there, but shut your ears to it. You know, can I insert a grump a minute? Mm. Sure. Um, you know, there's part of me that that's thinking. You know, in terms of what you said about you know we're failing and and whether you agree with that statement or not. But for that particular audience, if you define success as the gazillions of dollars that's in the industry and the number of jobs and employment, um, you know, it's not necessarily in their or our. If we lump ourselves together in our best interest to start succeeding because you know where do where do we end up out of out of a job we, we yeah up, this is yeah. this is the other thing we talked about last week i don't mean to step on your yeah, jack there but 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 we uh, one of the things that, that bugs me a little bit about security is we always look at it in terms of winning and losing and then winning and losing is a short game or a long game and i'm really becoming a bigger fan of the infinite game and and you measure your success by a simple question were we better than and judge your period by this time last year, by the last 90 days, better today than we were yesterday. And, and then this, this comes with it, are the people around me better than they were? If so, then you're doing a fine job. And I think by those measures, we're doing great. I, I think we are. And one of the challenges is that, you know, another way of restating what you just did is um, we have a lot of people that aren't willing to accept that good enough is good enough. We have a limited number of resources. We have a limited number of, of things that we do, and we have an unlimited number of catnip coming at us uh, to distract us. The, the more disciplined we get at prioritizing our assets and our efforts, the better off that we'll be. And yeah, I mean, there's no, if, we're, if we're searching for perfection and security, then good luck with that. But that's, that's, that's going to be a, a battle that's going to grind us down. You know, I want to add, too, because um, I, I, I've been more quiet about it with you guys, uh, or at least more vocal with you guys, but more quiet generally. I've really stepped out of the conference conferences and stuff for years. I, I still do some keynotes here and there, but I've been getting back into it and speaking at some more shows. And I have to tell you, I'm really blown away with uh, both the quality of uh, presenters and, and people sharing their thoughts now. Um, I, I, I'm sitting there taking notes and enjoying it. I mean, I'm enjoying too the way that a lot of these conferences are curating their topics and what they're putting up with. I mean, it's, but like, it's not just, it was, hey, you liked it better at RSA. I've been out of it for a while intentionally, and as I'm dipping my toes back in, I'm actually really excited by some of the stuff that I'm seeing. And again, right, couple that with everything else we're talking about, so we're getting better about talking about the things that we're facing. We're getting better about sharing our ideas and articulating them more thoroughly. That's, guys, this is, this is good news for us. We are an infant industry, whether we like it or not, and we're going to go through those growing pains, but I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of stuff to be excited about. It, it's uh, it's fun to dwell on the, the bad bits, right? There's always going to be stuff we can focus on that's wrong, whether it's at um, whether it's at RSA, whether it's at uh, DefCon, whether it's at a B sides, whether it's at Black Hat. You know, we can focus on things that we don't like about various things. Hey, if you really hate it, don't go. Um, yep. If yeah. you ha if you can offer constructive criticism, 
Uh, there are some people willing to listen. Engage with people who are willing to listen. Just flinging, you know, infosec monkeys flinging poo on Twitter and elsewhere is really so not moving us forward. You know, and and a final thought on that. Look, He's if got you got it. a it troll, the final go if ahead. you've got a troll, <laughs> up your game. Really, <laughs> don't be a sh crappy, lazy troll. If you need lessons, I think Rob Graham. Uh, probably will give you lessons, Davi Ottenheimer. There are some true masters of trolling. At least make it enjoyable. At least make it awkward and uncomfortable for everyone. And thought provoking. You know, and when Robert Graham trolls, dude, it's thought provoking. Absolutely. And after he trolls you, you're like, I'm going to shake your hand, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I trolled him on something a couple of years ago, and it was great because I actually had him going for like weeks. <laughs> um, but um, you, no, you, but do, do, that's not a challenge for folks. Don't don't don't, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't dive no, into the yeah. big leagues, man. <laughs> don't dive into the big leagues right you away. Know, Jack, you know, you Albert Williams, uh, Amart Singh. You know, th there are some masterful trolls out there. You know, if you <laughs> learn from the best. If you if you've got a troll, up your game. Don't don't just. You, Jack, you you brought out another point when you were talking that I think is. Uh, a little bit of a dirty little secret, maybe. No, not maybe, that's not the right, right, right way to say it. But the, there's a little bit of a problem in our industry, and that is the the thinking around the fact that attack is sexy, right? We we have this we have this challenge in the industry where where people who get into it go, you know, offense is really really cool. You know, I can break shit, I can break shit, and they keep pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, and they forget that there needs to be that reciprocal um, response. While they're doing that work to say, yeah, here's how you attack it, here's how you break it, but here's how you fix it. So, so, so Jeff, on that, uh, um, I'm ex-DOD, in case anybody didn't know, and uh, one of my old bosses was part of the uh, cryptographic panel or whatever they call it at RSA, and so you know, he uploaded a uh, video of the session, and he said something that I thought was really interesting in contrasting. He's an ex-Crippy. I'm an ex-Crippy. Uh, he he actually led both the offense and the defense side of the house at that place that we used to work, and he said b back when he no, no such agency no like such that agency exists. he oh. said that back when he was getting started I forget what year he said but on the uh, the defensive side which is designing crypto systems designing crypto cryptographic systems secure communication systems they had seventeen crypto analysts or technically cryptologists working but when he was on the offensive side of the house the side that tries to break codes there were 1700 so the ratio was a hundred to one exactly. uh, and, and I'm like you know that's kind of the same way it is in mm. in our industry with what we do there's so much more attention on breaking stuff rather than trying to create stuff that can't be broken. And what? I just learned that you guys are called crippies. Now you guys crippies. Do yeah, that, right. And to be, to be clear, that's... know what the bloodies are like. Yeah, I was, exactly. I was going to go there. <laughs> just to be clear, that's that's crippies as in short for cryptologist or cryptanalyst yep. as opposed to crippies and yeah, bloodies. Yeah, but if I see him with a blue bandana, I'm not sticking around. Right. right. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think that reinforces the, the point. That, and we know it in the industry. You do security research. You work really hard at something. And if you manage to break something and you can prove it, that's a really big rush, right? That's yep. a huge success. Yeah. It's fun. Uh -uh. And it's fun. Um, you manage to successfully defend against something, it's like, uh, But you know. come back a year later and the scripts you used a year ago are still there. Not so fun. Oh, right. And it's, frustrating. It's, it's fun breaking stuff. But I mean, it, so even, <laughs> even getting into art, one of the things blacksmiths used to like to do, and now stupid insurance regulations and wives and other <laughs> things stop us, is uh, shooting, <laughs> shooting anvils. Um, so, you know, blacksmiths want to make things. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff is ornamental and architectural these days. Uh, but one of the things that's really fun to do, like on Fourth of July, is before there were fireworks, you would flip your anvil over, pack it with gunpowder, write it and set it on a stump and then wow, light I'm it and Jack's then <laughs> you your anvil flies you know a few hundred feet up in the air makes a really big boom trail of smoke and fire goes up in the air and then uh, you know depending on your anvil if it's a if it's a standard you know serious anvil 225 to 325 pounds flies yeah you know 100 yards in the air and then it comes down and you're 100 and something yards away and you feel it in the ground and it's fun to blow shit up every now and then <laughs> but you got to build stuff you know you got to repoint the plows you got to make railings and stuff and it's, it's fun to blow shit up 
Uh, I like to see you try and run 100 yards after you let it <laughs> tell, on fire. Tell you what, you, you, you pack a pound and a half of black powder into a 300-pound <laughs> anvil, everybody near is running. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's yeah, to, running. Today they might call you a terrorist for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you want to know how what that looks like, ask ask the YouTube. It'll show you pictures. Uh, I don't know if there are any pictures of people having handles land on their heads, but uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, breaking that, stuff that is fine. We're, we're gonna. Uh, I hate to cut us short. Uh, we, we could talk all night, but we're gonna take a short <laughs> break. We're gonna get Dan McInerney. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Mac and Ernie on the show. Yeah, it's a good company. So I've, I already stay tuned. Them. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I mean, why is it that Asa 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 Dorian can't talk? <laughs> middle of the Santa Colangelo. Colangelo. <laughs> so the. <laughs> that, that was. 